This is Rome, the centre of the Roman Catholic world. 500 years ago, the Catholic Church was at the height of its power. And from Rome, the Pope, in effect, dominated Western civilization. This was the age when Leonardo da Vinci painted the Last Supper and Michelangelo decorated the Sistine Chapel. The Renaissance was in full swing, redefining the language of painting, sculpture and architecture. But music was developing at a different pace. At the start of the 16th century, sacred music in the Catholic Church was essentially that of the Middle Ages. But then one man would emerge that would change music forever. His name was Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina, the Prince of Music. This is St. Peter's Italian Church in London. Completed in 1863, its architecture is based on that of the classic Italian basilica. In the Middle Ages, the way that the sound of the human voice reverberated with vast spaces like this inspired a style of music that became known as polyphony, from the Greek meaning many sounds. It's a style that Palestrina perfected some 500 years ago. Today, Harry Christophers and his choir, the Sixteen, have become famous for their interpretation of his music. Palestrina's Missa Papa Marcelli is considered by many to be the purest and most beautiful example of what sacred music should be. To find out more about this hugely influential composer, I went to Rome, where Palestrina lived and worked at the time of the High Renaissance, the great artistic flowering that redefined European culture. On my journey, I would meet many fascinating people who keep Palestrina's music alive today. Palestrina is important to me as maybe Mozart is important to Austria. <laughs> this is, I mean, it's a soundtrack of my city. It's what, what we see always around. Some believe he is the godfather of all Italian music. Yet few people outside the world of sacred music know much about him. In Rome, my first port of call was to see two of the world's leading authorities on one of Italy's greatest, but often overlooked, composers. Hello. 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 Thank you. Lovely to meet you. I asked Professori Giancario Rostorola and his 92-year-old mentor, Maestro Lino Bianchi, why so few people had heard of Palestrina. In Italy, c'è il pregiudizio che la musica di chiesa è una musica secondaria. Questo è proprio il pregiudizio di base. E allora Palestrina era ben presente a Roma, dove c'è la Cappella Sistina, il Papa, eccetera. Ma perifericamente piano piano si è its spiritual quality, where, where's, where does that come from? How, how did he write music that was so spiritually, I suppose, pure is... 
La grandezza di Palestrina sta tutta nella sua estrema come dire, considerazione della, del patrimonio testuale della Chiesa, la conoscenza teologica dei testi. In pratica egli si pone di fronte alla, alla testualità sacra, ai testi sacri, con uno spirito di voler interpretare nei minimi particolari la spiritualità dei testi. But one part of Italy where Palestrina hasn't been forgotten is in his birthplace, the town of Palestrina, just outside Rome. In the early 16th century, Palestrina was part of the Papal States, Catholic territory, of course, but where the Pope was not only head of the church, but also head of state. It was an age when popes could and did raise armies and wage wars to maintain or increase their power. Then, as it is now, Palestrina was a sleepy market town. And here, in around 1525, Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina was born. Following tradition, he took his family's hometown as his surname. Little is known of Palestrina's early life, few documents survive, but legend has it that one day the Bishop of Palestrina heard the boys singing in town. Vergine bella, che di sol vestita. So enchanted was the Bishop with Palestrina's voice that he invited him to join the choir of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. Founded in the 4th century, Santa Maria Maggiore is one of the major basilicas of Rome. Today, it's still one of the most impressive buildings in the city. Palestrina is listed as singing as a choir boy here in 1537. Coming from such a small town, it must have been an awe-inspiring moment for the 12-year-old when he first saw this. Inside this vast building filled with gold and glorious works of art, every day people from all walks of life, both rich and poor, would attend Mass. And for the Catholic Church, music was an important symbol of its power, as important as any cathedral or basilica. The polyphonic style that Palestrina would later go on to master had originally been inspired by the architecture and acoustics of churches like Santa Maria Maggiore. The use of music in the Catholic Church had evolved over centuries, beginning with simple chants. Then these chants developed into a style of singing in unison, which is still used in many Catholic services today. When composers began offsetting and interweaving the voices, polyphony gradually became the dominant style of sacred music throughout Europe. And as a choir boy here at Santa Maria Maggiore, Palestrina would have learnt its principles well. Back in London, unravelling Palestrina's mastery of this complex musical language has been a passion for Harry Christophers and his choir, the Sixteen. How did the buildings he wrote for affect Palestrina's writing? I mean, can you, can you see it in the work? You the certainly buildings? can. I mean, the whole of you know, this music and this whole period of music is all based around the architecture of the time. And the people that are building the churches of the time actually also had in mind the vocal music 
that was being written. Uh -huh. I mean, you've got these fantastic arches in the buildings which resemble the arches in the music. And we'll give a little demonstration, actually, at the beginning of this, uh, this, this wonderful piece. And notice the way it, you know, it goes up to, to God. So it's actually following the arch up the, up the phrase to, to heaven. We've got this fantastic arch of the phrase, and you notice with the sopranos, then they gave this natural diminuendo yes, as the phrase went yes, down. Lovely. So when you've got all the parts coming in, you've got this light and shade, this ebb and flow. He uh, uses imitation, and he, he uses exactly the same tune, but he gives it to another line, but he does it later. Another exactly line. Exactly the same parts. material, and used at an interval of the, of a fifth. Can we so five yeah. notes lower than the sopranos? Could we? Could we hear that? Yeah, just hear just the altos and sopranos together. One. One arch, and then there's another arch. It's like waves and waves of arches. The whole thing is, is on these arches of phrases, you say. When every single part has come in, then it's time to bring in the next set of words. So it's very important in this music, because you, know, you think of the buildings, you think of the stained glass and the light that's coming in. That also reflects in the music. Palestrina's time as a choir boy at Santa Maria Maggiore effectively served as his musical education, and it must have inspired him to want to become a composer. As a young man, his best hope of achieving this dream was to work for the church. After his time as a choir boy in Rome, Palestrina returned to his hometown. From the Vatican archives, you know that between 1544 and 1551, he was organist here at St. Agapito's Church in Palestrina. It was here that Palestrina married his first wife, Lucrezia Gori, and it was around this time that he began to develop his own unique musical language. Palestrina's position here not only entailed playing the organ, he would have also been responsible for training the choir and overseeing the music for services. And it was probably in this very church that Palestrina had the first opportunity to perform some of his own compositions. It's amazing to think what it must have been like to hear Palestrina's music in this church for the first time, and what a contrast it must have been to the harsh realities of day-to-day -day life in the 16th century world outside. Today, the town still has its own composer and choir, so I went to meet Palestrina's successor, Maestro Maurizio Sebastianelli, and he was not quite what I expected. I was struck by the fact that nearly 450 years after it was written, Palestrina's music still resonates with these young people of the town, who are all enthusiastic members of the choir. This amateur choir have just returned from Russia, where they sang Palestrina's music. What is it about Palestrina's music that is so special for your choir? 
a parte il fatto che Palestrina è un capo scuola, è il maestro dei maestri, però è bellissimo cantare il Palestrina per, per il coro, perché ogni singola voce ha una propria dignità, quindi una, una chiarezza e una, una logicità proprio melodica, e si lascia cantare ecco, molto facilmente, poi il risultato verticale, quindi l'insieme delle voci è assolutamente fantastico. So is it difficult technically for singers? I mean is it a good discipline? Beh, è difficile, però ripeto, il palestrina avendo questa questa questo andamento melodico molto molto chiaro, molto nitido, si canta più naturalmente di tanti altri autori che invece hanno un approccio eh, un po' più verticale nella composizione. We know a little bit about Palestrina the man. Do you have a sense of him, what type of man he was? Che oltre ad essere un grandissimo musicista era anche un, un uomo vero, quindi un uomo di... Vero. Vero, sì. un uomo, quindi mm. che amava la vita e che... Yeah. anche un buon manager. From his humble origins in this small town, Palestrina found a way to express his faith through music so eloquently that five centuries later it still inspires composers today. This is St. Columba's Catholic Church in Glasgow. It's the local church of one of the biggest names in British music, James Macmillan. Although Macmillan has an international reputation, he is also a prolific composer of sacred music for his local church. And today, he's rehearsing a new piece he has written for Radio 4's Sunday morning service. I realised that I probably did hear Palestrina when I was very, very young, maybe even aged four or five. And I do have very, mem very strange memories of going into a, what seemed a vast cavernous space and hearing what I thought was something from heaven. But this is what the congregations must have felt like on encountering Palestrina's music for the first time in Rome, in, in the Sistine Chapel or wherever. And this is the curious thing, that this highly wrought, complex music, four parts, five parts, eight parts in, of lines interweaving, must nevertheless have had an effect on the listeners that made them think that they were in heaven. That gives me, as a composer, a message, a message from history that uh, sometimes the most complex things in music and in art can achieve uh, the most numinous and spiritual uh, openings to whatever the divine may mean. As a young composer in the early 16th century, it probably seemed to Palestrina that he would spend the rest of his life working in his hometown. He must have dreamed about getting a job in Rome, where the Renaissance had been in full swing for decades. The cultural and political centre of Europe had shifted when the popes had moved from Avignon to Rome. Now, all across the city, beautiful new buildings and stunning works of art were springing up everywhere. The Renaissance was transforming all of Italy as fiercely independent city-states vied to express their power through the arts. But by far the biggest patron of sacred music was the Catholic Church in Rome. So composers from all over Europe flocked here. 
Such was the power of the Catholic Church that the music it commissioned spread through Western Europe and was heard by millions. Only the Vatican could guarantee a composer exposure like that. Being signed up by the Pope or one of his cardinals was rather like landing a major record deal. In 1551, Palestrina had a stroke of luck that was to change his life forever. The bishop, who had first spotted his talent and encouraged him to join the choir at Santa Maria Maggiore, was elected Pope, Pope Julius III. And he took Palestrina with him to Rome, where he made him choir master of the Capella Giulia here at St. Peter's. And in honour of his benefactor, the new Pope, Palestrina wrote this Mass, Ecce Sacerdos Magnus. Published in 1554, Ecce Sacerdos Magnus was part of Palestrina's first book of masses. In a world dominated by foreign composers, it was one of the first to be written by a native Italian that helped establish Palestrina as a serious composer in Rome. Palestrina's first book of masses an incredible uh, set of set of works, uh, and it's very noticeable right from this, these early days that Palestrina is, is a genius of, of form. It's the way he shapes the music, the sonority of the music. He uses a lot of suspensions on notes. It's a very simple effect, but he always comes back into the line. He never sort of uh, veers off at a tangent outside the vocal line. And really, you know, this is a trademark of a very accomplished composer. In 1555, Palestrina's reputation was growing rapidly, and he was made an official member of the Capella Sistina, the Sistine Chapel Choir. A great honour. After just four years in Rome, Palestrina had landed one of the most important musical positions in the Catholic Church. The Capella Sistina was responsible for providing the music for papal ceremonies. This is the choir today. And just as it was in Palestrina's time, it is made up entirely of boys and men. Members of the Capella Sistina were expected to be celibate and to live as if they were members of the clergy. But the Vatican decided to overlook the fact that Palestrina was a married man with children, which made his appointment all the more significant. Apparently, his voice wasn't really up to scratch, and other members of the choir weren't best pleased that he had seemingly sidestepped the tough entrance exams. But of course, the Pope hadn't appointed Palestrina for his voice. He'd appointed him to give him time to write music. His star was very definitely in the ascendant. 
Palestrina's appointment to the Cappella Sistina was an astonishing achievement. Up until then, all the major composers to work with the Catholic Church had come from abroad. And perhaps the greatest of these had been the Flemish composer Josquin Desprez. Although he died before Palestrina came to Rome, his music must have been a big influence on the young composer. Josquin had first come to Italy as a young man, and after working for various cardinals and aristocrats, he joined the Cappella Sistina, the papal choir, in 1486. As a member of the most important choir in Rome, he also quickly went on to establish himself as one of the greatest composers of the High Renaissance. However, the serenity of Josquin's music was in stark contrast to what was happening behind the scenes. Josquin was here for five years and worked for two popes. His first employer, Pope Innocent VIII, hardly lived up to his name. Among other things, he's noted in history for having fathered eight children, towards whom his nepotism was as lavish as it was shameless. The unsympathetic chronicler Stefano Infestra provides us with a lively account of Innocent's life, including an apparent attempt to revive him on his deathbed with blood transfusions from three young boys, all of whom died in the process. Even if only some of the tales are true, it gives us some idea of what life was like in the city when Josquin was here. Josquin was a hugely influential figure in the development of sacred music, well known for the inventiveness and the profound expression in his work. I asked Harry Christophers to demonstrate why Josquin is considered to be a master of the polyphonic style. Polyphony, many voices, mm -hmm. the use of many voices, and in this context, it's the imitation of an idea. So we have this initial idea, let's have the soprano sing the initial idea. That initial That's idea? tune one. Tune one. <laughs> but tune one is repeated one bar later by the altos. And that's exactly the same. I mean, that's the same pitch. It's like a, a, exactly a route, the same like another yeah. bridge is falling down, Absolutely. or uh, yeah. exactly the same. It starts on the same note, and uh, it's it's very simple imitation, very effective. Hmm. This lovely thing of the higher voices and the lower voices. I mean, using the different yeah, very sections simple of the, like an orchestra. And that I think you know makes Josquin so special from this period. I mean, we've got to remember he's he's 1500s. We're talking about, and this is relatively early polyphony. And there's no better person from this, this time than, than Josquin, mm. an incredible composer that a lot of people then lived up to afterwards. But later on in the piece, he, he brings in a, another effect, syncopation, where the parts rhythmically fight against each other in a very, very jagged way. Mm. Let's hear this. So yes, the, the, the lower parts are what we call off the beat. So off the beat, you've got the so tenors you... off the beat and then the bass is on the beat, so the whole thing yeah. is fighting. Yeah. And it's very much like, you can imagine a car but changing gear very, very, very quickly. It's, it's really, <laughs> it's jagged. Yeah. And then at the very, very end, in this final Alleluia, which also ends in this amazing cadence where he, the penultimate note, he just holds it. And then suddenly you get onto the final chord. Let, let's hear it, because it's very, very exciting. It's fantastically powerful, isn't it? And he actually 
mark that in the music. He marks that, that as this. If you want to hold that, yes, penultimate chord. Quite clear there that he wants that last that penultimate chord held for as long as you like. Yes, I bet it's up to you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a nice bit. I love it. Let me hear that again. It's pretty good. Go one more time. Josquin is a good example of how sacred music, like all the other arts, was becoming increasingly more sophisticated as the Renaissance progressed. It was almost as if composers were in competition to outdo one another with their own elaborate interpretation of the polyphonic style. Effectively, polyphony was doing to music what perspective had done for painting. The use of perspective during the Renaissance brought to painting a whole new dimension, as in this wonderful Caravaggio. This was painted around the time that Palestrina wrote a piece that would change the face of sacred music. You see, polyphony was an enormously significant idea, as was perspective in painting. But for the church, there was a problem. It was all to do with clarity. As polyphony developed from the Gregorian chant, and composers began overlaying and interweaving so many voices, the words of the mass were becoming harder and harder to hear. Listening to Gregorian chant is the equivalent of reading this typically Roman street sign. It's simple, clear and comprehensible. Seen from this angle, the sign, although perhaps aesthetically more interesting, becomes harder to read. And that, for the Roman Catholic Church, was the problem with polyphony. And there was another bone of contention. The church was concerned about the melodies that composers were using in their work. And there's no better example of this problem than the music of one of the best-known composers of the day, Orlande de Lassus. This is the St. John Lateran Basilica, the cathedral of the popes, where Lassus was music director. Although he was born in Mons in what is now Belgium, like many composers of the time, Lassus had travelled around Europe working as a court composer for various aristocrats before coming to Rome. In his lifetime, Lassus wrote a staggering 2,000 pieces. 60 of his masses survive, but it was his mastery of polyphonic style that made him famous. So famous, in fact, that the Emperor Maximilian II made him a nobleman and Pope Gregory XII made him a knight. And after his time as the musical director here, Lassus wrote this mass, Missa entre vous filles. However beautiful Missa entre vous filles must have sounded in the 16th century, there was a problem for the church when they realised where Lassus had got the actual melodies from. He got them from French composer Clemens Nonpapa's 16th century hit, Entre vous filles de quinze ans. It's a little too racy for me to translate here, but suffice to say, it's a celebration, amongst other things, of young women's breasts. Lassus had chosen his tunes from a popular pornographic folk song. 
It was not unusual in those days for composers to use tunes that had been written by other people as the basis for their works. So Lassus, who was a man who enjoyed a joke, it seems, and the good things in life, was doing nothing unique or out of the ordinary. But when the Catholic Church found out where the melodies for its masses were coming from, it was not best pleased. Sex and sacred music don't mix. It's a bit like finding out that your favourite hymn is based on a raunchy pop song. Lassus was an extreme example of a problem that the Catholic Church had been facing for some time. So the Pope resolved to do something about it. In the mid-16th century, Pope Paul III convened the Council of Trent, which tried to address the many problems facing the Catholic Church of the time. The most pressing problem was in Germany, where Martin Luther had begun what would become known as the Protestant Reformation. The all-powerful council, which sat three times between 1545 and 1563, was also charged with looking into the role of sacred music. In 1563, the Council of Trent stressed that sacred music should not be lascivious or impure. And astonishingly, they threatened to impose a total ban on polyphony being used in the mass at all. And then one man was going to write something so beautiful and so pure that according to legend, it would change their minds. On the 23rd of March, 1555, Pope Julius III died. A month later, a plume of white smoke above the Vatican told the world outside that a new Pope had been elected. And his name was Pope Marcellus II. Then, as now, the demands made on the Pope were enormous, and Marcellus was not a healthy man. The pressures of high office, combined with a series of hugely exhausting ceremonials and rituals, proved to be too much for him. He fell gravely ill, and despite apparently being wrapped in steaming sheepskins, just 22 days after his accession, Pope Marcellus II died. However, Palestrina was to ensure that he would never be forgotten. If Palestrina's Papa Macelli, it, it is an incredible piece. He takes us back really to the way we speak, and he puts music to that. He gives a note to each syllable. But in the hands of another composer, uh, that could sound really confined and very boring and very static. With Palestrina, he treats it as the voice would speak naturally. You know, we can have an analogy to Shakespeare, and you put the English text into the hands of Shakespeare, and the, the meter and everything and the lyricism, it has a great power to it. And it, it isn't simply the fact that he puts a note to each syllable. It's the way he, he constructs the phrase, shapes the music in a, in a, in a really brilliant way. And I think that's what you know, sets Palestrina apart from everybody else.
At the third and final session of the Council of Trent, there were many discussions about the use of polyphony and whether it should be banned. In 1607, the composer Agostino Agazzari wrote, Music of the older kind is no longer in use because of the confusion and babel of the words. And he went on to say that this music would have come very near to being banished from the Holy Church by a sovereign pontiff had not Giovanni Palestrina found the remedy. Palestrina is arguably the first in a long line of great Italian composers. No one is quite sure precisely when he wrote the Missa Papa Marcelli, but it was that work that sealed his reputation. In 1585, he became a founder member of the Santa Cecilia Music Academy in Rome. The Academy would become world famous. Other influential Italian composers such as Corelli, Scarlatti and Rossini would all come here. Today, the school holds one of the most extensive music libraries in Italy, and deep in the bowels of the building, I was given the chance to see some of Palestrina's earliest surviving scores. Now, could I, could I see the Papa Marcelli, just for fun? I think it's possible, <laughs> for fun, yes. Right. No. Wow. Missa Pape Marcelli, <laughs> yes. 82. Why do I get excited by that? The Pape Marcelli Mass was Palestrina's answer to the Council of Trent, wasn't it? He had uh, in, in his ears uh, still uh, that input by Papa Marcelli, who was uh, a, a pope, only for three weeks. That pope wanted a intelligibility uh, of the words in the Mass. And so Palestrina had that inspiration, and we don't know exactly when, but he composed that Mass. Now, I don't know whether I'm imagining this, but it looks simpler. That's a good observation. It, it looks uh, simple, and it is simple. Ah, now you see this. Now this is interesting. Because there are a lot fewer notes to the words, yes. aren't there? And you can actually see that yes. there. That a a syllabic. Syllabic, that's the word. So one note per syllable. So we're going to see now, don't open it yet, we're going to see now one of the two autograph manuscripts in Palestrina's hand. Yes. Right, here we go. Sono. Is a motet, mm -hmm, Beata es Virgo Maria. This is amazing. Yeah. This is amazing, isn't it, to see it's, his hand? You, you get respect. Yeah. Think, yeah. Well, how amazing they've survived. And you can see here also typical uh, characteristics of the composition of Palestrina. Yeah. So there we go, there's an example. If you leap up, you have to come down. Yes. If you leap down, yes. you have to go up. I felt hugely privileged to be holding music actually written in Palestrina's own hand. Palestrina rewrote the rule book for the use of polyphony, making use of the natural rhythms of spoken language, ideas he went on to expand in his later work with pieces such as Alma Redemptoris, asked Maestro Alessandro Quarta just how much it differed from Palestrina's early work. What personally I noticed is a, a sort of um, more sweetness he's got in writing. And according to the Contro-Reforma style after the Concilio di Trento, uh, the homorhythmic 
uh, style, because of the, um, the text, there had to be a clearer understanding of the text. That's why this piece proceeds in a more homorhythmic way, and this is typical of the second Palestrina. There is always in Palestrina a sense of nobility, a sense of, it is not a wild mannerism as many other composers of his age made in the late 16th century. Does that tell us something about him as a man? Was he calm? Uh, I haven't met him, but, <laughs> <laughs> but what I can understand from the news we have about his life, for example, the, fa the fact that he never wanted to leave Rome. I mean, in spite of lots of requests from Duca di Mantova, from very rich courts, he never wanted to leave Rome, and this says a lot, I think. Why is he important to you? Palestrina is important to me, as maybe Mozart is important to Austria. <laughs> this is, I mean, it's a soundtrack of my city. It's what we see always around. It sounds like Palestrina. It, I know it's a little bit You're a Roman. romantic. I'm Roman. Roman. Yes. So he's your composer. It's yes, your city. absolutely. It's my tradition. Is it's what is the, the language of my of a part of my city. The Counter-Reformation saw a massive reorganization of the Catholic Church, and Palestrina could not escape the reforms instigated after the reign of Pope Marcellus. The period immediately after the Pope's death was a difficult one for Palestrina. On the 23rd of May, 1555, Pope Paul IV took control over the Church, an elderly man renowned for his rigid morals and severe character. Some said that sparks flew from his feet as he walked around the Vatican. When Pope Paul IV declared that all members of the Sistine Chapel Choir should be celibate, Palestrina was dismissed from his post. After leaving the Sistine Chapel, Palestrina came to work here at St. John Lateran, a great basilica, of course. It's the cathedral church of the Pope as Bishop of Rome, but musically speaking, it was a step down. Although in terms of prestige, Palestrina's appointment may have been a demotion, it was still a very important position. At the time, St. John Lateran was the largest and most impressive of all the basilicas in Rome, famed for its acoustics. Though no one could be certain, it is thought that whilst he was here, Palestrina composed this motet, Secret Cervus. Palestrina's successor as choirmaster, Monsignor Marco Frisina, and the singer Pina Magri explained to me why this motet was particularly significant for the choir here. How would you describe Palestrina at his best? E Palestrina so. riesce a dare luce e trasparenza alla polifonia. Palestrina gives light and transparency to polyphony. Palestrina dà una chiave, una interpretazione. Palestrina gives a key. 
He gives an interpretation. Fare della polifonia non qualcosa che soffoca il testo, ma qualcosa che lo esalta. Making polyphony something that does not suffocate uh, the melody, but that exalts it. Le melodie di Palestrina sono melodie italiane. <coughs> Possiamo dire che l'ha inventata Palestrina, la melodia italiana. The phrasing is very uh, Italian because it derives from an Italian melody. This is what... Ah, perché oh, l'arco Jesus. melodico è un arco melodico completo di un It's fatto per un respiro. It's a complete arch, which is in one breath. All on one breath. Yes, no. In two, two breaths. Two, two breaths. Però questo respiro lungo crea una melodia con un arco che poi ritroviamo in verdi, in puccini. Tutto. A freezing, which is an arch. And so even though, well, there are long, there are long, there are long breaths, but even where there is a breath, the phrasing is a very strong melodic arch. And very Italian. They said like Puccini, Puccini and Verdi. Yeah. Which leads afterwards yeah. to Puccini. After five years working here at St. John Lateran, Palestrina resigned after a row with the church authorities over the quality of the food for the choir boys in his care. Although Palestrina continued to work for the church, money was an issue as funds were increasingly diverted from the arts to pay for the fight against the Protestants. I went back to his birthplace, to the Palestrina Museum, to ask Professor Herzog about the latter part of Palestrina's life. We know that when Palestrina lost his first wife and most of his family to the plague, he took the first steps to become a priest. I wanted to know why, at the height of his fame, did Palestrina do it? I think there was an ambiguity. He was religious, it's, it's true, but he, he, he looked very much also his interests. And so, as a composer who, who wanted to become more famous uh, through his uh, publications, so he, he thought uh, that the better solution was uh, marrying a rich widow of a fur merchant. And so he had uh, many, many uh, possibilities to uh, publish uh, his works. He could publish his own work with his own money. Palestinian never published so many of his works like uh, in this period uh, after the marriage with the rich widow. Now, thanks to his marriage, Palestrina was financially independent and no longer reliant on the church. And for his wedding, he wrote a collection of motets based on an erotic section of the Bible, the Song of Songs. In 1584, Palestrina published it himself. According to Maestro Lino Bianchi, Italy's foremost expert on Palestrina, it was the composer's second great masterpiece, one that would have a huge influence on the development of Italian music. E con questo Palestrina ha associato due due cose importantissime. Una l'esprimere la propria il proprio sentimento del nuovo matrimonio e l'altro di scrivere una grande opera, perché la musica di quel tempo sentiva il bisogno finalmente di esprimere, come le, tutte le letterature, l'Ariosto, il, il Tasso, le grandi opere. La musica non l'aveva ancora fatto. E con Palestrina, Palestrina creando il Cantico dei Cantici, crea una, un primo grande poema. How do you consider the latter part of his... La, il, il prodigio di Palestrina ha scritto più di cento messe su tutti i soggetti, sia da soggetti profani sia da soggetti sacri, propri e altrui. Questa è una padronanza tecnica incredibile, incredibile. Però il suo scopo non è esprimere questa padronanza tecnica, è esprimere l'anima, lo spirito che c'è dentro in questa, fino a raggiungere dei momenti di estaticità, proprio l'estaticità. 
è stato il più grande proprio in questo senso. Although in the latter part of his life it seems that Palestrina had become disaffected with the church's internal politics, this never undermined his faith. He embraced many aspects of the Counter-Reformation, and although in old age he wrote fewer works for the church, he continued to produce religious music, choosing to write in his native Italian rather than in Latin, until his death in 1594. Today, Palestrina's music has become as much a part of the Roman landscape as any church or basilica. And almost five centuries after his death, it is why in Rome, Palestrina is still called the Prince of Music. If you're kicking yourself for missing any of the first two episodes of Sacred Music, they're being shown back-to-back Sunday night from 7. More music tonight on BBC4 as we trace the history of American gospel music. Omnibus Through Many Dangers is next.